All right, we'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the uh, fifth panel in the series of the Planet Earth panel series hosted by the Environmental Science Club here at BYU. Um, tonight, our topic is planning sustainable communities, local ideas, and global perspectives. Um, tonight, our panelists are Suzanne Whitehead, the Chief Operating Officer at Help International, which is a nonprofit that works in, um, in international development. Uh, we have Don Jarvis from the Chair, the chair of Sustainability at the, the Sustainability Council with the, the Mayor of Provo, and Stephen James, the Manager of Community Planning Design of Kennecott Land. Um, we'd like to welcome the panelists with a round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we'd like to, to start off with just hearing a little bit from you guys, you know, three to five minutes, about your ex experience and expertise in, in planning um, and developing sustainable communities, right, here along the Wasatch Front or internationally. And we would like, in, in, in the time that you speak, for you to answer the question of, in your perspective, what is one key component of sustainable community development? Um, us, most of the, the audience here tonight are students interested in, in honing in their skills and, and developing their skill base to be able to solve some of these, these global and local issues. So we would like to hear your perspectives of, of how we can contribute to that. Uh, we'd like to start with, with Don Jarvis. Okay. Uh, I have 76 years of uh, experience breathing air, which makes me an expert on, on that aspect. I like to breathe clean air, and that's part of the reason I'm interested in sustainability. I uh, taught Russian at BYU for 34 years, and my wife and I spent uh, three years in uh, Moscow and Yekaterinburg running missions, and uh, we saw some really bad uh, pollution over there, which actually shortens one's life. The average life expectancy in Russia is pretty low, but in Moscow it's actually 10 years less than the rest of the country. And we had our, our hair was falling out. And, <laughs> and then we, we got moved to Yekaterinburg, uh, where it was, it was cleaner over there. It's kind of on the, the Ural side of the, I mean, the uh, other side of the Urals. And after we'd been there for a while, we came back to Moscow and said, you look so much better. <laughs> so it made me realize that uh, there is, uh, there are issues for, of sustainability that have immediate effects on people's health. Uh, I guess my experience in sustainability and working to make Provo more sustainable uh, came after I was asked by the mayor of Provo to be a sustainability advisor in 2011, so I've had four years of experience uh, working on this and reading and trying to learn all I can uh, about the issue. And uh, a key component of sustainable development, it seems to me, is uh, uh, not only interest by the ordinary people, uh, uh, citizens and residents of an area, but also by the political leaders there. I've had been able to see some good success in Provo City, but it's largely, none of it would have happened without the total uh, support of the mayor of Provo and uh, lots of good people in Provo City that are really in favor. I find that most people are, are not in favor of a polluted community. Most people are not in favor of, uh, of polluted air. Most people are, are very much in favor of doing the right thing and given the chance they do. So I think a key component of sustainable development is, is good government leaders and people who will elect good government leaders. Yeah, thank you. My name is Suzanne Whitehead and I work for Help International, like Ian said. Um, Help International focuses on establishing communities that are sustainable by Focusing on a lot of different aspects, um, Help International sends um, holistic development teams abroad. So we take students, young professionals, and the areas of focus usually fall under public health, business, um, and education. But we kind of take the team and from there decide what projects fit best within the community. So if we have 15, 20 students on our team and half of them are public health, there'll be a lot more public health um, projects than if most of them are business or dance majors or whatever it is. 
Um, so we really do a holistic approach to, to development because if you look at why a community is poor, there's so many elements that go into that. Um, so sustainable development in the third world is really different um, in the fact that people don't care if the air is clean if they're hungry, right? So there's a lot that goes into addressing immediate needs so you can focus on other projects that you care about while you're trying to get other people to care about them as well. Um, so I think an element for us really is trying to instill hope of longer life. Um, if It's hard because you'll talk to people about future projects and future things like save your money because you need it for later. And future often isn't a, a thing on people's minds in the third world. They don't care about the future generations that are going to hit their village because they're trying to survive them and their own kids. Um, so it's really a multi-level issue that you try to address when you go abroad by focusing on the immediate needs as well as teaching reforestation, that this tree will eventually matter, but we also want to address the things that matter to you today. Um, sure. So I, yeah, so I'd say that's something that I think is a key element. Great, thank you. Steven. All right, hi, uh, my name is Stephen James. I direct the uh, design work out of the Daybreak Project, which is a bit of a laboratory, and it's a big enough project that uh, we can learn as we go. When we think about uh, land development and community development through the lens of sustainability, we're really thinking about three things. We, we use the Brundtland Report definition of sustainability, which is uh, sustainability has a uh, social and economic and an environmental uh, uh, component. I particularly work on the hardware side, and it sounds like you work on the software side a, a little bit, but creating a mechanism or a series of interrelated systems that allow sustainable behavior is essentially uh, my area of focus. And what I do is I watch and monitor how people begin to live and occupy in the spaces we create and adapt. And as we do this, we also try to move the market in a way in which uh, hasn't been uh, done for many years. Uh, automobile, uh, the development of the automobile really changed the form of, of community. And as we look at sust sustainability, we're really trying to find out how do we use less energy? How do we develop in a more compact way so that uh, we spend less time on the road, less time idling? But we also, in a very proactive way, create choice, uh, try to create balance in the way we get around uh, designing for pedestrians, for bikes, as well as vehicles, and how do these systems interact? How do we overlay things like stormwater runoff, uh, protect watersheds, uh, but also um, uh, look, f uh, try to promote uh, biodiversity? Uh, and and how does the human uh, civilization fit uh, within this system? So that's really interesting. As I start to think about what aspect of sustainability is really uh, critical. Uh, you know, I think it is that we as individuals choose to behave uh, sustainably. I think as uh, technology has changed, th things have become uh, more mechanized. We rely on the machine uh, quite a bit. And uh, one seed I want to plant in your mind is this idea of the original green. Uh, Steve Muzan wrote a book called The Original Green, which is how did we do this when, <laughs> before we had machines? Um, and so uh, uh, sometimes I think gizmo green gets in the way of sort of the simple low-tech uh, approach to green, and that's what we're really trying to look at uh, at Daybreak, uh, is, is developing an understanding of how little uh, we can get by with. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Now, the remainder of the night is mostly going to be questions from the audience. Um, some of you who have recently come in may have not gotten a small list of questions, or you might have seen them. Now this is a, a list of questions that we try and provide for the audience to, to just be able to kind of see um, or, or get some sort of you know, simple ideas flowing, uh, questions that, that you guys might have. Um, some of them touch on different topics of culture and um, corporations and governments, different things like that. So. The rest of the night will be, will be kind of directed and, and, and led by the questions that the audience has for the panelists. Um, and uh, we will, as we get closer to um, 8 o'clock, we will we'll end with an, another short um, question for you guys to answer to kind of tie everything together. Um, and 
one question that I would like to start off with, um, and, and, and for the audience, the questions can be directed at one or any or all of the panelists. Um, so as you, as you think about that, think about their, their skills and, and expertises that they've just mentioned. So do you think, um, or for, for any of the panelists, is there a difference in your mind between sustainable development and sustainability overall? Maybe, Stephen, um, seeing that you're more in the hardware side and kind of the development side, do you, you know, as you're, as you're planning a community and you're thinking about the future, right, you're planning for sustainability, do you see any difference between that and true sustainability of that community? I think sustainability is a broader topic than sustainable development. Yeah. Uh, because it does require uh, that people buy into it and that it can be sustained economically over time. Um, as, um, as Suzanne uh, alluded to, people will tend to, to make uh, short-term choices if if they're just trying to get by. Um, I, I see sustainable, a sustainable development as a means uh, for sustainability. And what it is is always evolving. It's having to react to market forces. Um, um, and technology changes over time. And, and so what might be sustainable today might not, you know, I, I don't know that it's static. Mm. It's definition. I think it's uh, dynamic and we're always discovering uh, how to develop uh, sustainably. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Don, do you have a comment? Yeah. Uh, you don't have uh, sustainability without sustainable development. Uh, if, if you try to take a, 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 a community that is largely urban sprawl and, you try to, and people want to get together and, and uh, reduce air pollution, it's really hard. Mm. To, because you just have to use your car. As, as uh, Stephen said, uh, we are a vehicle-centric uh, population. Uh, Dallin Oak said that sometimes your blessings can become your curses, and there's a lot of wonderful things that come from having everybody having a car. As one of the hardest things in our, our community, one of the worst things that happen to the community is everybody has a car. Uh, you get... Uh, uh, you, you have to get in your car and drive to, to get a loaf of bread. Uh, many students, I think, are, are seeing uh, difficulties as they live in, in apartments here, and uh, you, you just can't get your groceries without getting in your dang car and, uh, and going somewhere. So if you don't have sustainable development, if you don't think about clusters and sort of things that uh, Stephen deals with every day about having mixed-use development and having uh, little walkable neighborhoods, then you're stuck with your car with all the pollution and expense that causes. Um, and uh, there's a huge difference between uh, sustainable communities uh, with good public transportation and ones without it. Uh, if you look at uh, where's the most expensive communities in the United States to, to live, you immediately think, oh, Washington, D.C. and San Francisco. That's where the most expensive housing is, right? But if you add in the cost of transportation to that, uh, and by the way, and then Orlando, Florida would be kind of low as far as how expensive it is to live. Uh, if you add in the cost of transportation, then, then the, whole, the whole list flips. And uh, it turns out that San Francisco and Washington, D.C. are actually not that uh, hideously expensive to live in because the cost of transportation is so cheap. They have great public transportation. Orlando is hideously expensive because there's almost no public transportation. You have to drive everywhere in the long ways. So, you, yeah. They have to go together. You don't really have, it's really hard to get sustainability unless you have some sustainable development too. And of course that brings up a question, what do we do when we have, we have uh, all this urban sprawl? Well, it's not easy to fix. And we're not going to fix a lot of it. But the new, at least the new, the new uh, development should be with a consultant like Stephen. However, there's, sprawl happens for a reason because it's cheap in the near term. And it's zoned. That's yeah, a, that, which is this, this issue of if you only have so much money, what do you do with it? Yeah. And, and when, when you consider zoning, you consider the cost and investment in trying to change zoning. Uh, you know, people who are developing, you know, time is critical because they have a note at the bank. Yeah. They have to start paying it back. So as a systematic 
uh, approach, it's it's not really that simple. No, but but it is. If you have the zoning right, yeah. then the developers want to do mixed use and they want to do uh, uh, higher density housing because it's a lot more rewarding for them financially than single family housing in quarter acre lots. And then the question is, well, where do you put the car? <laughs> uh, I mean, can you really get rid of it unless the broader region? is walkable and it's tied together with uh, transit. But as soon as you have a car, you have to park it somewhere and it takes up space. And whenever you aggregate all that space into a parking lot, you create pedestrian deserts uh, between spaces. So it's, it's really an interconnected web of political issues, meaning zoning, financial issues in terms of how these places are financed and developed. And uh, uh, it's it's yeah. an interesting challenge, and I, I look forward to seeing how you, as a group, <laughs> begin to tackle these issues. Yeah, thank you. Um, if if anybody has questions, we have a microphone up here, so just step right up. Have no fear. Yes. And any question you have, yeah, you can just come up. Um, can you use that microphone or this microphone? Yeah, don't be shy. I saw you raising your hand earlier. Um, Oh yeah. If if okay. would you would you mind introducing just your name and what you're studying, yeah, if if you're in school. So my name is Emily. Um, I'm a biology major and I'm emphasizing in horticulture. So um, I have a question for all three panelists. I think I would like to hear first from Suzanne about the remote countries and the go up in development. But I have heard a lot of mixed reactions and opinions on public transport, and I understand from people who have. Um, been to places like Guatemala where um, cities are very far spaced that public transport like buses are valuable and even often overcrowded whereas in like cities especially here in Provo where everyone does have a car you say oh I gotta run to the grocery mart but there's not a whole bunch of car pulling I've heard that buses are almost detrimental because unless there's like enough people who ride them the fuel is almost put to waste because of how few people are allowed to get around. So I would just like an opinion from all three on bus transportation. Well, in the third world, most people do not own individual cars, so that's definitely not an issue that they face. Um, public transport is the only way to get around if you're trying to go far, like if you're trying to visit family or get across the city, or and obviously it depends if you're in a a big city or if you're in rural, um, help kind of works in probably half and half. Some of the locations are big cities, like in India we work in Hyderabad and it's huge and it, it's so hard to get across that city, um, no matter what you're in. If you're in <coughs> um, a taxi or a moto or um, a bus, it's going to take you at least an hour just to get across. And there's the problem with public transport there um, is there's no like laws, right? So there's no, it's kind of like a clash of first world and a second world, like if there are cars or there are taxis, there's, there's not the, there's no emissions tests, there's no street lights, there's no, it's just like a free for all. Um, so the, the public transport and the, the streets are dangerous for a whole another reason than just being pollution, which is obviously more us, right? Everyone's isolated in their own car and driving around. Um, they're definitely not empty. The buses are overcrowded in most of the countries I've been in. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure about my opinion on that because I don't know a lot about the public bus systems in the states, whether they are. I mean, it's hard to say that, yeah, you should do this and you shouldn't do that because I think mostly when you look at development and you try to look at sustainable development, you have to break down the culture of every place you're at and what's going to work for that place. Um, I think that's where people get in trouble in development is trying to do like blanket answers of like, yes, buses are always good or no, you should always do this um, because it causes issues in policy. Um, I studied anthropology at BYU and I feel like that was one of the things that I love doing with help is we don't do blanket answers. Some things that work in Guatemala would absolutely blow up in Nepal and never work. And so you have to kind of see like, what are the values in this culture? What, if, what do people need? Do they need public transport? Do they need more um, systems that are more community-based? Um, I think you can look at communities and there's some things across the board that people need, 
where they need belonging, they need certain aspects of a community, but it's really hard to say, I think, which I don't know if that answered it, but I don't know. I'm sure you can add more than I can on that one. <laughs> Public transportation is really effective if you live by a station and where you're going is by a station. Uh, outside of that, you're, you're making uh, compromises. So let me provide a little bit of a personal experience. I live in the avenues in Salt Lake and I work in South Jordan at daybreak. And uh, I was probably 2004, 2005, uh, being involved in this daybreak project. Uh, I had some wonderful mentors, Peter Calthorpe uh, in particular, uh, who I worked with within, for a number of years, who's trying to help China solve its problems. And I realized that if I want to understand what it is I'm doing, I need to do what I'm doing differently. So I sold my car. And I uh, sort of put it to a personal test. Can I get away uh, without having a car. Can we be a one-car family? And here I have three uh, daughters in high school and, uh, and, and, that work? and my wife at home. I, I have to say that it's probably been the best decision I've ever made. Because what it did is it sort of reconnected me to life uh, in, in a way that I had lost touch uh, with. Uh, I got a bike. This is how it started. I got a bike and I commuted 25 miles each way. And uh, my pants got smaller, I felt better, I was healthier than I had ever been, and I was saving about $600 a month on car payments, insurance, and gasoline. And when the weather was bad, I would ride my bike to the train station. Now, I still do this in 2016. Matter of fact, I was trying to figure out if I could get here in time on the front runner today. <laughs> If you brought uh, your bike. You if I brought, uh, well, it was uh, when I could leave work, and unfortunately I couldn't, but I wanted to make a point uh, by, by doing that. <laughs> because by thinking sustainable, uh, sustainably and making that choice, not only have I changed my own life, not only do I save a lot of money, again, uh, that's the economic sustainability part, I feel better, that's the socially sustainable, sustainable part, and uh, my emissions are next to nothing. And there's something that's really satisfying, frankly, uh, about being free from a system which is really designed to take your money from you. <laughs> and and, it, and it's, quite, uh, it's quite liberating. So if you want to take advantage of something like transit, you really have to choose where you live. I made a choice to live in the avenues. It's a small home built in 1890 on a tiny lot. But that's OK, because I don't spend but five minutes mowing the lawn. Uh, we walk to church. Uh, there is a restaurant down the street. Uh, and we're half a mile from uh, tracks. And so by making that choice, it's impacted my life in such a way uh, that I am, I'm, I'm very pleased with. And I've, my, me making that choice and my wife making that choice has changed the thinking of an entire generation. So my three daughters uh, ride their bikes to school. We hook the little cart onto the back of our bike and go up the avenues to Smith's. And it didn't take uh, but a personal effort uh, to help others realize that it's actually a nice way to live. And I can't imagine sitting in traffic, you know, for 30 minutes on a commute in a car in this little steel box where there are all these people next to me and I can't even say hi. Usually you get the one finger high, you know, when someone cuts you, <laughs> cuts you off. But it's really, it's really strange uh, when you think about it. Yeah. Thank you. Steve is my kind of guy. <laughs> uh, I'd like to go back to the, I think the original question was, you know, what's, what's the, what's the break-even point for public transportation for most people like here in Provo? And I hear this all the time that, oh, why do they want to put public transportation in, in Provo because I see all these buses and they're always empty. Uh, and it's not true that they're always empty, but when they, the folklore gets out there. But it is true that there is sort of a, a break-even point where you, you have to have enough demand for the public transportation to make it work. And uh, again, urban sprawl is the enemy of public transportation. You cannot make a public transportation work when you're in a uh, suburban area with the single family homes and quarter acre lots. It just doesn't work. The only place you can make it work is where, where you have um, centers 
and then you can uh, send uh, buses out to other centers, but you, you really can't just run it through every, every street in, in, every, in every neighborhood. So the trick is to, uh, I think most of us, unfortunately, will still have to have our cars to, to get around. Um, I admire your courage, Stephen, and your, and your, and your teenagers' <laughs> willingness to, to knuckle under to dad. And uh, they don't probably see it that way. They probably see that he's, 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 that's great, that's wonderful. Um, but it, it isn't easy. Most of us will probably still have to have our cars, but we can, we can uh, use our bikes more and more and then check that, those public transportation schedules and see where it will work. Uh, my wife and I almost never go to Salt Lake anymore without taking uh, front runner and tracks. When we go to the airport, uh, go to, out of town, we take front runner and tracks to the airport. So it's a, uh, there, there is a, a difficult break even uh, point and it's not e easy to find. And, and uh, Suzanne's uh, suggestion to look at the, the situation carefully before you make a decision, uh, that, that works for here in the, in the first world too. Well, I would say that I just got back from Nepal two weeks ago, and I don't know if anyone's up on the issues with India and Nepal, but they just closed the border from India, and Nepal survives everything off of India currently. They don't get along with China. They culturally fit in better with India, so that's where most of their, um, their buddies are. And they just got a constitution in Nepal, and it's the first time they've had a constitution in 10 years. It's, been, it's a huge, huge victory for the country, but India hates it, so they cut everything. There's no fuel in Nepal right now. And it was towards the end of our program, and I cannot imagine trying to run that program in the beginning because I didn't realize how much we all needed the public transport so bad. Um, everything shut down. There was no food. There was no way to support the city. And all the public transport takes the people in the outside edges of the city to the city to work. And so there are no, no stores. Like, it was, it was really intense how it was just like went from like, you think crazy third world busy roads, and then you think ghost town, and that's, just what it was. And it was so odd to kind of see the, the very stark comparison, but it's odd where in the US we wouldn't survive without our cars, but in Nepal, they, I mean, the city, the outside villages, it's different obviously, but in the city they couldn't, they couldn't survive without the public transport. So. I will say just one more thing yeah. about, about getting used to public transportation and thinking about using it. Uh, we had a grandson come and live with us last year he grew up in uh, most of his uh, teenage years in uh, Florianopolis, Brazil. And so he was used to using uh, public transportation. So he came to our house and he needed to visit his grandma in, uh, and, and he worked in Springville and he was going to UVU. And I thought, oh man, he's gonna be asking us to run him all over or he's gonna be borrowing the truck all the time. But no, he was used to using public transportation. So he looked up the schedule, he found it, and he'd occasionally call us when there was some glitch. But most of the time he got from Springville to UVU, to our house, uh, using public transportation and walking. A lot of it is a mindset. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm an environmental science major. Uh, I'm focusing on going into agronomy. Uh, my question is more focused on like the global perspectives. What role do you envision developed countries similar to like the US and a lot of Europe? <laughs> Yeah. Any, anybody? Yeah, that's hard, you know, because most of the country doesn't make, and if you look at developing countries, most of the developing country, the people there don't make the decisions uh, for the country. Um, so I think it is the responsibility of the U.S. I, I have strong opinions on foreign aid um, and making sure money goes where it's supposed to. And I think that the U.S. should be careful of who it does business with, who it trades with, who it supports in foreign aid. Um, based on the responsibility of what they're doing. Um, I, and I think, it, I think if you look at sustainability, there's so many aspects to it more than just a carbon footprint, right? Um, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And I don't know all the elements that this audience is most interested in hearing about, but I think that all the elements are important, especially looking at it on a policy level. Um, they might be doing great things in one area, but if they're killing their people, if the women have no rights, if a large portion of the population is missing, 
Um, I think it's a big picture thing. Like I said, we do, we do a holistic approach to development because there's so many aspects to communities that matter. Um, and being socially conscious as well, I think that America, America, if it gets what it wants, it's happy, but it needs to look at where things are coming from. Our kids in child labor are, um, what's the sacrifice for what we're getting? And I think that gets overlooked a lot in the third world and people suffer because of it. Um, but I think that, yeah, a big portion of the, of the population doesn't have the voice that it needs and it, it's the policymakers in America, the business people, they, they, should, they should care and look at more aspects of the communities that they're trading with or doing business with. Thanks, Suzanne. I think sometimes uh, America can be damaging to uh, developing countries when we think about what we're exporting as a culture, uh, and again, exporting reliance on automobiles. Uh, I mean, look what China's done over the last, in their industrialization, they've essentially mimicked uh, the uh, American urban pattern. And you look at the air quality in, in China and it's, it's really tough. It's not that there weren't challenges already in the rural context, um, but uh, many uh, countries aspire to the uh, lifestyle uh, that, that we enjoy here. And we're just learning you know, the impacts that that lifestyle has on our quality of life. Um, and so I'm not sure the American model is always a good model uh, to use. I mean, this became really clear to me, uh, you know, when I served a mission. <laughs> Where did you serve? I served in East Germany during okay. the reunification, so I was in Dresden in the East. Uh, but uh, it, it was pretty incredible to learn and discover, as I'm sure many of you have, that there's a different way to get around there's a different way to form cities and towns so that uh, our resources aren't invested so uh, deeply in uh, individual transportation. Uh, the way the land use uh, patterns uh, uh, relate to each other. In America, we've taken this idea of, of land use, like here's all the housing, here's all the office, here's all the retail, and we sort of divided them. Because when we buy a house, we want to protect our investment. And the only way we think we can protect our investment is if we're surrounded by people just like us. And which is, which is really unfortunate. I think it's kind of a false notion. But what's happened is that uh, the institutions of development are built around this idea. And it has become a really easy uh, way of developing. Um, you know, in other places, uh, uh, and uh, you know, Don talked about uh, mixed-use uh, development. It's a blending of uses, and uh, there's a compatibility uh, in character. And this idea of uh, you know land uh, ownership is kind of irrelevant in a way, and land values are, are uh, irrelevant. And. Um, I apologize, I lost my train of thought. I think I went down a path that wasn't related to the question. But... Uh, Happens to me all the time. Yeah, there, there is... <laughs> there Why is you get to be 76? Oh, <laughs> man, I feel 76. Um, but anyhow, I'll just, I'll just okay. stop there. Great, thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll take the next question. Seems like there's a cluster of questions coming. My name is Andrew. I'm an environmental science major, and my minor is international strategy and diplomacy. Um, so my question to all three of you is, um, both domestically and also internationally, what are what are some of your favorite sustainable practices that you are seeing in developed countries? Well, uh, I think one of my favorite sustainable uh, practices is. Uh, is what uh, Stephen James is doing there in the in the daybreak, uh, doing some thoughtful uh, planning, seeing the whole picture, and trying to reduce the amount of driving people have to do. Uh, I think if there was one word I'd like to 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 see more of, it's uh, what they call TOD, and that's not just death in German; mm -hmm. it's transit-oriented development. Uh, because you, if you're as you ride front runner, 
he, he, it's amazing that the influence it has on, on development along the track. It's, they're, they're just growing like mushrooms along the track. Uh, uh, residential housing. Uh, most of it tends to be uh, high rise, and I'm not sure all of us want to learn, live in a high rise, but um, I think that transit oriented development is, is one of the most interesting things that's happened here on the, along the Wasatch Front recently. Uh, we have the advantage of having most of our population just strung out along this mountain valley. And so it's been a good place to, to build Front Runner and, uh, and then tracks to, to, uh, to connect it with the, the communities. And it's, it, this is a sort of a back to the future moment. I just attended the uh, governor's um, air and energy symposium uh, a, a week ago Tuesday. And uh, everybody's talking about, uh, you know, what, uh, what's going on with, uh, with how public transportation is changing things. And it's, it, it's the most exciting uh, uh, disruptive ideas right now going on along the Wasatch Front are guess what? Trains, <laughs> streetcars. <laughs> this is 19th century stuff, but it, it really works. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> developed countries are, are great for a lot of reasons, right? And undeveloped countries are great for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the perks of being developed is that all parties involved in a community can actually play a role. Um, the, the things that, so I guess that's an aspect of developed sustainability and developed communities that um, we try to strive to for, I guess, is trying to make sure that all parties can play an active role in it. If you're not developed to the point where you can't even get water and the women in the village or the women in the town have to spend eight hours a day just getting water for life, then that's eight hours of time they could be spending elsewhere in a community. They could be with their kids, they could be working, they could be getting income, maybe they'd be at school. Um, and so I think that's something that we take for granted is that so many aspects of developed communities can be um, an active role in the community. Um, and that's, that's something I think that we strive to develop in the communities that we work in, but you don't realize who's missing, and it can be really damaging. When I first got to India, my very first day there, it was like, there's just something wrong. Like, I couldn't, like, place it. And it wasn't until, like, day three that I realized all the women were gone. They weren't there. They weren't on the streets. They weren't in the stores. I, like, it took me, like, hours to find one, and it's because they were all at home. Culturally, it's really not acceptable to be without a man in India on the streets. And so when the men go to work, the women stay at home. Um, and so there's cultural aspects to it as well, but of why maybe people are missing. But a lot of it is because there maybe isn't public transportation. They can't get to a city center. There's no community center. There's no um, water tap. Um, so those are the aspects of de developed communities that I think are great. I think the most significant uh, uh, aspect of sustainability that I'm seeing right now is in America is at least re rethinking the street. I think for the longest time, uh, uh, cars have been the king of the road, so to speak, but before the car, it was the person. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, many of our streets, the connecting streets are built by the state, they're UDOT streets. Uh, and what I've learned in working with uh, UDOT is they design for the 85th percentile, whether it's how many people use it or how fast you travel. So if 85% of the people using a street travel 90 miles an hour, they'll lift the speed limit to 90 miles an hour. If 85% of the people using a street are in a car, then they'll design the entire street just for a car. And I think what's starting to happen now is, is rethinking that let's not just be reactive to the users. Let's actually try to design in uh, uh, balance and choice. Because in, in the West, we pride ourselves as sort of being free. But the reality is we're not. We're, we have to be behave in the way this current system wants us to behave. It, it's sort of an uh, economic connection to the infrastructure that's built and the tool that we have to use the infrastructure. Um, but the complete streets movement uh, in the U.S. is really think, rethinking the way streets ought to be designed to accommodate people on foot and on bikes. And we start to see that quite a bit in Salt Lake. Um, 
uh, as well as other uh, cities around the country. What we're doing at Daybreak specifically along those lines is developing what we're calling the open space chassis or a bike highway system where we're actually running, uh, and this is uh, where we're moving right now, is, is running, center running cycle track down the middle of every arterial street and turning it into a boulevard. So essentially we're, tr we're putting uh, the jogger or the cyclist on parity with the car in that they will have uh, signalized uh, you know, crossings. Uh, we're creating safer environments uh, where we're thinking about the pedestrian and the cyclist now where we're taking the bike off the side of the road where there are always these right-hand conflicts of cars pulling in and out of parking lots or turning blocks. Anyone here get around on a bike? Probably know what I'm talking about, where someone will speed up and slow down and turn right in front of you. And, and what we're trying to do, again, is systematically think about how do you actually develop communities using a different chassis, a different framework. And so we're now orienting smaller blocks, or the smaller edge of blocks into these busy streets to slow the speeds down. Uh, the intent is, is if we're trying to create balance in a street network and we want pedestrians and cyclists to use it, we actually need to slow the flow of traffic, but allow them to get from point A to point B at the same time at slower speeds. So by eliminating many of the signals, introducing things like roundabouts or other passive traffic flow uh, me mechanisms were able to do that. Uh, what's interesting in Europe recently, uh, there have been a few studies where they just eliminated all the signals altogether and found that traffic flows just fine. As a matter of fact, I was in Salt Lake City the other day when the power was out, and it was really interesting to see how well traffic flowed without any signals. Because when people uh, uh, have to uh, pay attention to the environment, they behave safer. People pull up, they slow down, they look, and they go when it's clear. And you know, often when we design for a single mode of transportation like uh, the automobile, people expect that if it's green, I get to go. And uh, when we look at you know what's happening with vehicular uh, pedestrian or vehicular vehicular uh, deaths, uh, it, it it doesn't. It's actually not a really wise way uh, to work. That's why I sort of like this idea of low tech. A green low-tech system. Some, sometimes we outsmart ourselves with the with the solutions we come up with. Um, but creating parity uh, for users on a street, I think, is important. The second thing is that we begin to pair land uses uh, with the right environment, uh, so that uh, you know who who grew up in a suburb here. You know what's interesting about most suburbs is that they're designed so that you come and go through the garage door. And then you have a, uh, your private green space out the back. And so everything about that suburban environment is really tooled around the vehicle. So if we want to find ways to switch that uh, and, and really provide choice, we need to think about how you come and go from your home. Um, and, and so that's what we're doing at Daybreak is sort of thinking through how do the streets relate to the open space system. Uh, how do we organize the blocks along those streets? How do you actually site a house on a home? You know, we, we set these really strange expectations when we develop even our commercial land where we set the buildings back and there's a big parking lot out front. Have, have ev any of you ever tried to walk to the mall? <laughs> I mean, it's really strange. I, I remember uh, when I was living in Minneapolis going to graduate school, I had to drop my car off and get the tires changed. And I thought, there's a mall right over there. And it's this big old building. It must have been a half mile away. <laughs> and I had to walk through this parking lot. And it was really an awful uh, experience. So how do, you, uh, uh, how do we as society rethink uh, the way we, we site and place buildings on lots, pulling them to the street, putting the front door on the street? Um, and it's really a, a tough shift you know, for many uh, institutions, especially banking. Yeah. Uh, uh, to deal with, because in the banking world, uh, often in retail development or apartments, uh, there's a certain asset class that's developed. Uh, there's a predictable return on that asset class, and uh, whenever anyone tries to in innovate, they'll say, "Well, I won't fund it because it's not predictable." And and so you know the way shopping malls and strip malls are developed, uh, it, it um, it's a hard it's a hard change to make. Interesting. Um, so, anyhow. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Stephen. If you, you would like to, to uh, read a uh, sort of primer to get you into some of the things that uh, 
Stephen's talking about, and Stephen will probably think this is old fashioned because uh, he's probably much more up on that. I would like to recommend that you, you think about uh, getting uh, Suburban Nation, the rise and sprawl, the rise of sprawl and the decline of the American dream. It's by Andres Duaney, Elizabeth Pleiter Zuberg, and uh, Jeff Spock, Speck. Uh, it's, it's a marvelous book, and if, if you don't, wanna ha don't have time to read the book, I have summarized it for you. Perfect. <laughs> and if any of you want to pick this up, I have uh, 20 copies here, and it, it gives you uh, a, a quick look at what you need to do to uh, come to um, a lot of the conclusions or the uh, suggestions on how to design a community that, uh, that Stephen's talking about. That's great, great thanks. Great book. And it, it does mention that very thing, how just to get to a, to a to a, 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 a mall is almost impossible. They're not built so people can walk to them. Yeah. They have the big, often have big chain link fences around them. So you have to drive. <laughs> Those are great perspectives, thanks. So for the sake of time, we'll just keep the, the answers now to just a minute. Um, the panels always, <laughs> Sorry. no, the panels always go <laughs> quick. It takes like a little bit of time yeah. to warm up and then, <laughs> and then we just wanna keep going. But yeah, next question. biology major, which has literally nothing to do with this, but here anyway. Um, I'm a student at BYU. I don't own a car. I take a bus if it's convenient. I walk if it's down. If I don't, um, or I walk if it's not convenient. Uh, and I rent my apartments. Is there anything that I can do in my current situation? Do I have power over anything that can influence the sustainability of my environment? Yes. <laughs> Great. What is it? That's what we do in the Sustainability Committee in Provo. We have to hear a, a, a big uh, uh, poster from the Mayor's Sustainability Committee. We talk all the time about what people can do. And if on your way out, you'll pick up one of these little cards, <laughs> it'll tell you exactly what you can do to help, help make the, the air better, and which is one of our most serious problems here in, in uh, Happy Valley. I said, most of the time our air is really good, but we have about three weeks, three, four weeks of some of the worst air in the whole United States. And uh, this is what you can do to help it. And we also, if you'd like to put up a nice sign, leave me your email and I'll send you one of these. Breathe easy. The clean air starts with you. It has five things you can do. So, Perfect. Thanks, Don. Did anybody else have another comment for that one? Yeah, and I'll make it quick. Okay. Enjoy it when you do it. Because if sustainable behavior makes you happy and people see it, then people will come along. The next thing I would recommend is, I was just on an urban design jury uh, for the state of Utah yesterday. We had an awards uh, banquet and uh, Provo Orem did a master plan along the State Street Corridor that was pretty incredible mm -hmm. of setting up uh, nodes uh, that are transit based. Uh, and so what I would encourage you to do is when developments like that occur that are designed for people like you, opt in because unless the market responds to the work of people who are trying to do this, uh, it won't continue. So when you recognize uh, an opportunity to support something that someone else is doing, uh, become a partner. Great, By the way, you. our sustainability committee has two BYU students on it. One's an urban design and one's a journalism major. And they're great. <laughs> the third can be <laughs> We have, we have no upper limit on how many people can join. <laughs> Do we have another question? I'm Brenda Nelson. I'm studying anthropology. Um, and I'm wondering, Dr. Jarvis, you mentioned um, that the reality is that the way that our infrastructure is now, people need cars. And I'm wondering whether there's any way that you see that we can adapt the infrastructure that we have to maybe not Well, we've been talking about public transportation, using it, getting a mindset of trying to trying to do what the, the last question, uh, the last uh, person who asked the question does. They look at the schedule, try to figure out how they can get here and there. You do like Stephen and I do, bike everywhere you can. I biked to Rotary today. It was snowing. Everybody thinks I'm nuts. I felt great. <laughs> um, walking. Um, oh, and there, here's one thing. I want you all to raise your right arms to the square. Okay, come on, raise your hands. I promise I will never go through a drive-through again. I will park and walk in. Okay, <laughs> drive-throughs are evil. If I were in charge, I'd make every one of them, uh, I'd close every one of them down. Because what happens when you a drive-through? You idle. sit there and idle, and idling is, is bad for your car. 
It's bad for you. It's bad for the environment. So don't do it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> A ride through. Yeah. Another question. I'm studying environmental science, and this is a broader question. Um, but currently, there's been a lot of heated debate whether the market, the free market, has been a help or a hindrance to sustainability. So, if you could just comment on that. Yeah. Any, anybody? I, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, many in the community development realm say they're responding to the market when they really aren't. I mean, this was Daybreak was intended to be a test bed to see if there was market demand for these ideas. And ever since we opened, we've been the leading selling community in the state, and many years we've been in the top 10, top 20 master plans in the country. There's an unmet need, and uh, many developers are simply lazy. It, uh, they're, they're not in willing to invest the time uh, to think through uh, the issues. Many developers might as well be selling beauty boxes. It's a widget. A house is a widget. It's a mechanism for getting return in business. Um, and so we ought, as a society, raise the bar uh, and actually describe to the development community what it is we really want, because they think they're developing it. And uh, if, if it's not aligned uh, with your thinking, let them know. I'm a fan of free markets. I'm more of a fan of educating people on what they're doing. Um, I, I don't think laws <coughs> and, <coughs> sorry, like a bunch of extra laws often help as much as let's go into communities and teach people. Let's teach people what's going on with the products they're buying or what they're um, focusing on. Again, going back to like what is sacrificed for what you're getting, I think is a really big, a big issue that people don't know. Um, <coughs> and they don't, they don't care to look into. But why? Why don't people care? Why are all of us still going to go through drive throughs right? Like, we all know. We all just got told. And lots just promised. But I think there's a greater thing. Like, does it matter if you go tell people, like, hey, don't do that. Don't buy that. Um, it, it doesn't, I don't think. I think people get around it. There's always black markets. There's always other things. I think going in and, and working on communities, a lot of what we do is capacity building, um, where you go in and you, you find out why people are doing what they're doing and you address that, rather than just telling people like, no, don't buy that, yes, do this. Um, so that's kind of the side that we focus on that I think would make the most impact, um, is focusing on that. Great. Yeah, she's talking about giving people information. I think information is crucial to let make, having the market work. Uh, you would not pay anything extra for a high efficiency car. I would not have bought my, my uh, Camry hybrid, I paid the extra money for that, if I didn't know what kind of mileage it was gonna get. But once, since I knew what the mileage was, I was willing to pay the extra. Uh, now we have a situation right now where we're trying to get our legislature to, uh, to uh, uh, approve a, a, a stricter building code, which is not gonna be as strict as what probably goes on daybreak anyway. Daybreak is way ahead of everybody else. But uh, a lot of the, the builders in the state don't want to go there because they say, well, you know, the buyers don't care, and if you give them a choice between a high efficiency water heater and a marble countertop, they'll choose the moderate, moderate marble countertop every time. And I said, yes, that's because they don't know the energy efficiency of the house. And if you could tell them the energy efficiency of the house and how much it's gonna save them, they're gonna have a, a, a cash, uh, uh, net cash positive in, in two years with, with better building code. If they knew that, they'd, they'd be willing to put the extra 1200 to $3,000 into a into the quarter million dollar house. Um, but now, but then when we asked the, the legislature to, to give us a, a bill that would require uh, uh, builders and, and realtors to have an energy code on every house, they balked. But, but that is not allowing the market to work. Uh, but the realtors did agree to, to put something on the, on the multiple listing service that would give an energy rating for every house. Hasn't, hasn't hit there yet, but when that happens, then it will help the market to work and what Suzanne's talking about, it will help with the information. People are willing to pay more if they know what they're going to get for it. That's great. Thanks. So it looks like we have two people with questions over there. Um, is there anybody else in the audience that has a question at the moment? Okay. So we'll take those three questions, just one after another, and then we'll hear the answers. Is that okay? So we'll do the questions and then all the answers. Yep. Carrie. My name is Carrie Russell, and I'm also studying environmental science. And my question 
might reveal my naiveness on this topic, but are there consequences that um, we will face like detrimental to our society if we don't reach more sustainable practices on a specific timeline, or have we are we already facing specific consequences because of that? Yeah, yeah. perfect. So is there a timeline to the sustainability scramble? Andrew Sack is studying international development. I uh, was trying to form a good question. I was still forming it. But um, with the different methods of sustainability internationally, particularly with education and, and business, is there a best method um, of using either or, or fusing the two to create and, and find those best methods for each individual place like you were talking about earlier? Um, specific to the culture, to create sustainability in those places. It's our best method to finding those niches in the individual places. Excellent. Thank you. So as the panelists, as you're thinking of your answers, try and maybe combine answers to several questions. Hi, I'm Jacob Johnson, economics major. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't heard any really ask about the impact of animal agriculture on sustainability in terms of like the amount of pollution or waste that it produces. Um, there's a new documentary out called Cowspiracy that really sheds light on, on on how much of an impact that has when compared to, you know, it trumps in a lot of ways, you know, the, the effects of transportation. <coughs> and so I just wonder, are we, you know, hacking at the branches and not hitting the root of the issue? Or, you know, is, is there another way? Great, thanks. So we'll hear the answers from the panelists in, these, in those three questions, and then we'll wrap it up with, with one final question from the moderator. Yeah. Well, uh, there are huge consequences of not being sustainable. Whether there's actually a timeline, uh, it's just getting worse and worse. Uh, we have 8% uh, uh, of uh, children in Utah have asthma. And uh, they are profoundly affected by the by the, the pollution we have. And you may have come from some place that's that's more polluted than, than the Utah is, but uh, it, it's a serious issue. And uh, we just had some some good friends move up from Colombia, and they were in our ward. And both the mother and the daughter have asthma. There's enormous consequences from not from uh, having uh, bad practices with with uh, with uh, driving everywhere and, and polluting the air. And that's not in addition to, of course, all the issues of global warming. And I think you're all aware of those, and I don't think we need to go over those. But uh, uh, many people f feel we're, we're almost over the edge on, on global warming, that we're, we're going to reach a tipping point very soon. Um, but it's probably beyond the scope of this, of this group to talk about. But when, when the snow starts to melt off, the, off Greenland, and you, you, you get uh, sort of a catastrophe theory starts to, to work, if you know what that is in mathematics. Um, I love that documentary. So good. Um, and I, agriculture. Yeah, just the cows. It's yeah. true. There's a lot of issues, and it is really hard to know, like, our, like which one is the most important. Um, I think putting timeline, putting how do we, is there a best practice, is which one do we focus on. Um, I think that for you as an individual, it, it is hard to see. Like, how many times do you hear things and walk away change? Um, and I think everyone has to figure out what they're most passionate about. If it's water consumption and you care about that, then do it. Where do you care about it? Do you care about it locally? Do you care about it internationally? If you care about it internationally, go there. Um, it's, you cannot develop best practices unless you've been there. I really believe that. I think that what is lacking from a lot of development is field work. Um, if you care about Africa, go to Africa. If you care about water, go figure out, go try to set up a water project, find an organization um, that cares about what you care about and invest in it. Um, read books on it. I, get, I talk to people a lot. They're like, my whole life dream, I wanna do this. And I'm like, cool, Like, what have you done then towards that? And they're like, well, I've thought about it a lot. And it's like, <laughs> that's great. Go do something. Get involved in what you care about. If it is local transport, then join the committee in your, in your community. If it is a country, get there, read up on it. Um, if, if you talk to one person, they tell you they're doing something really, really well, go talk to 10 more people. Um, 
figure out every, every time you're doing development, there's pros and cons. Um, I've had I've seen just as many development failures as, as successes, and anyone that tells you they've only successes successes is either lying or they don't know what they're doing. So um, it really does matter to get involved, and I think that kind of is the way to get all of those things at once. Timeline, yeah, I don't know. Um, we've, I've been in communities that there's just trash everywhere. And to that mom that's trying to build a, her own community for her family, like it's already too late, right? Um, for us, it is pollution, right? For, or, I don't know, there's so many issues. So I, I would say pick one and you be the answer to it. Um, don't try to look and figure out what other people are doing and say, oh, that doesn't work. Like, figure out why and, and get on it. Get to your country. Be the one that develops the best practice. Um, if there's more people that get involved and get on the ground and start working on things, then that's, I think, when real change happens. And when you get inspired to actually maybe give up your car, where you maybe do start buying into what you're hearing more. Thanks, Suzanne. I think uh, you know par my parting thought might be uh, think about what is human scale. So the comment about the agriculture or the or the farming. If you look at say the beef industry and and you think okay Midwest maybe uh, outside of um, Lincoln, Nebraska, there are these large farms and uh, it's really affordable to aggregate land uses like that in a spot to run an app, uh, an operation, but then you have to ship it so far. Um, well, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, the scale of the city, uh, the human scale is, let's say it's a five, ten minute walk. How do we get all the uses we need within a small, manageable area? Uh, the community forum allows us uh, to behave sustainable, uh, sustainably, but it's not always most affordably delivered. And so there's this, this idea of balance. We have the demands of the, of, uh, the economy. We have the uh, demands of... Uh, of, of, of this social network as well as the environmental de demands and somehow we have to try to find balance in that and I think uh, I think that's hard and I think depending on where we are in the world where we are in the country will tend to bias uh, to one aspect of, of that three-legged sustainability stool um, I think it is important though that there is uh, you know is there is balance uh, because when we approach a problem with balance uh, we're able to relate to more people. If we approach a problem radically, we tend to, you know, there, a large section of the population will often just ignore you. Uh, so if you consider uh, the needs of the whole in your efforts uh, uh, to pursue sustainability, I think you'll find your efforts to be more productive. Great, thank you. Um, so for the final question, um, as you guys kind of maybe collect some thoughts. Uh, I'd like to take some liberties as the moderator to maybe turn the, the conversation in a slightly different direction, um, but a, maybe perhaps a slightly more uplifting perspective of, um, well, it seems that uh, all three of you are members of the LDS Church uh, from the talk of wards and missions. It's kind of and the bottleneck of BYU, it sounds like. You all are LDS. Um, we, okay, putting that aside. So we have um, the, the issues that I think of when we're talking about developing and planning these sustainable communities. Um, seems like often communities are already built, right? And so we're kind of having to like restore them and, and sort of destroy them and rebuild them without really removing them, um, which seems like a tricky thing. but. Uh, as, as an LDS community, we believe that one day we will live in a community known as Zion in, in Jackson County, Missouri, right? A place that currently is not developed. Um, but we have this, this, this idea that there, there are these expectations, or from my perspective, I feel like there are expectations that God will have for us um, to be able to live in a way that is sustainable for the planet, right? We'll be there for a thousand years. It sounds like a long time. Um, so, what do you guys think? I mean, you can you can kind of uh, invent this however you feel, but what do you think are some of the things that we, as members of the church and students at BYU, ought to know and feel to be able to get to that point to live in a community where all feel um, 
respected, all feel loved, and there is a, a sustainable aspect to like the physical things, right? Like eating and transportation. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's a very vague question, but perhaps there, there are some things that maybe you guys can think about in that. We'll, is it okay if we start with Steven and come this way? Sure. You're yeah, okay. <laughs> You know, as I think about what that idealized community might be, I have a hard time imagining that there's just one type. Hmm. Because, uh, you know, this earth was created with diversity. And I think uh, within that diversity, there's also space and room for divergent points of view. And I can't imagine that there's one type of place that we would all enjoy most and part of the beauty of, of being on this incredible earth is is that we get to pick which places we choose to enjoy. Uh, you know, I've got a daughter uh, who absolutely loves the city and a daughter who absolutely loves, loves the mountains. And the daughter who loves the city always complains that on vacations we go on backpacking trips. <laughs> and the daughter that loves the, uh, you know, the mountains always complains when we choose to go to the city. So, you know, my, my sense is that those places will be varied, but each one will have a sense of balance. Great. Um, I think that social responsibility to each other is something that will be a defining factor of Zion. And I think that it's hard when you get put in cultures where there's things wrong, like in India where the women are missing, like here where you're isolated. That's one of the issues I, I think that developed communities have is you're so isolated from each other in your own car, and you, you, let's go on a drive versus walking over and knocking on a friend's door and be like, let's go on a walk, um, or just things like that. You're just so isolated from each other and people feel really lonely. Um, where I've loved being in underdeveloped countries where it's just a free-for-all, like everyone is in each other's business and you're all in together and like, your hut's open and their hut's open and everyone knows everything and it's so it's so easy to love each other because you know each other um, and so I think overcoming that now and realizing that you don't have to buy into the isolation factor of a developed society you can um, break cultural norms go do something else that brings people together in a different way and reaching out to people that feel isolated I think in developed countries often you get rankings of like extroverts are more are of more worth than introverts. There's a book called Quiet that goes into that and how different um, people and communities get valued less in like how you view them and so then they don't, they're not involved yeah. and you miss them. And I think in Zion everyone will be involved and everyone will feel socially responsible to each other, to love each other, love thy neighbor, right? Yeah. Um, where, and a lot of times you don't, you don't know your neighbor here and I think that you can start now to overcoming that. But I think that'll be kind of a defining factor of all communities, regardless of what they end up being in Missouri. Yeah. You know? Those are two great answers. Oh, by the way, have you been to Jackson County lately? I haven't. It's all developed. Oh, it is. No, okay. No. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. I for talked me. to some people from there, and, and they said, you know, this is very important in Mormon history. They had no idea. So, anyway. <laughs> um, so how do we get there to something uh, in the way of an ideal community? Um, I think again, the the, uh, the the important one of the most important things is to help people to see uh, for into the future, and we need to be looking where where is what we're doing taking us, and if you can look and see where it's taking us. Uh, Brigham Young used to say, uh, "I have to do a lot of work to keep my mind continually focused on the future." A prophecy, the gift of prophecy, isn't something that just uh, settles on you like the dews from heaven. P apparently, it takes work. And uh, I'll bet that uh, Stephen does a lot of work thinking about what, what this plan is going to do. Uh, and I'll bet this, that's the same thing for everybody in development. You have, to, you have to see where this is taking you. And one of the things that's been really rewarding to work with the mayor Provo is that first thing he wanted to do, uh, and one of his campaign promises, was to do uh, a 20-year plan for Provo. There wasn't really, really one that was, was viable. And so we sat down at the first of his administration and we, we tried to figure out what we wanted to happen in 20 years. And uh, one of the reasons we have 
uh, front runner and a lot of good things on the Wasatch Front is because there was a group of people who decided that we do need to think about land use planning. And they formed Envision Utah, which was sort of a, a, a private group funded by, by some private uh, money. And they got some of the best people together to, to think about the future. And once you get people thinking about what you want in the future, then they do the right thing. So let's all develop the gift of prophecy, OK? <laughs> Great. We'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here tonight. In Russia, you clap for your audience, so I'm going to clap for my audience. And we'd like to thank all of the audience for being here as well. Um, and we just have some small gifts for the panelists, some, some BYU fudge, uh, as well as um, some, some gifts from the Kennedy Center, who helped and sponsor this event. Thanks. <laughs>